Let me start with uh, apostolate. As we have heard from uh, two previous great speakers, ultimately we came here, CO2 or not, by the way, CO2, I totally believe and agree with some of the statements here. But when it comes down to describing the earth climate system, climate change, global warming, global weirding, atmospheric cancer, whatever you call it, how does it work? So, being a scientist, I really have worked very hard over these 28 years to try to learn something. I think I can put it in two sentences. The first sentence is to say that the system is really multivariable and multidimensional. It's a couple nonlinear system, dynamical system. Whereas all the simplistic way in which you try to describe climate system as merely a forcing and feedback between the concept, which is totally arbitrary in some sense. Especially when you remove the seasonal cycles, and then try to study everything in terms of what they call the temperature anomalies. That's, that's a big cheat. What I'm trying to say that you try that, you will simply fail, which means you will never learn and understand anything. And part of my contribution today, which I never had a chance to speak about it yet, but I'll tell you today, simply because uh, last year, maybe around June, or August or so, we actually managed to publish a, a paper that I can be proud of and I want to share with you some of the results, which involve actually the first accurate calculation of the boundary condition, meaning revisiting the old problem of how the Earth is going around the Sun and the two geometries, all these different stuff, angles, rotation, precession, everything is controlled by the rest of the planets and how that incorporates into how the sun itself is actually changing in terms of its dynamo behavior. There is no doubt that the earth and weather climate system is powered entirely by the solar energy. Think in terms of number if you want something like a watt. The sun is actually giving up at least a billion times bigger power than the, the, the earth for sure because earth is basically a uh, uh, a planet that entirely depends on, uh, on, on the sun for energy. Just for some sense of equivalence, the world's most powerful laser is at least still two, two order of magnitude smaller than what the Earth uh, itself can emit. But the first question I want to ask, as I try to allude to, is do we actually, as of today, 2018, because after all the billions and billions and billions of dollars, by the way, another thing that I'm extremely proud of, is that the work that I'm about to report to you, none of it is funded, thank you very much. <laughs> and it's whether we can answer this question, do we even have the boundary condition of this thing correctly? First of all, we need to know what the sun, intrinsically, in terms of its magnetic property, how it modulates the wind, uh, solar wind, and actually how it interacts with the cosmic ray, and then of course also the light output itself. So just the sun itself is that complex of a, of a body. But do we have even, the idea of how the Earth is going around the Sun and then the orbits is being changed ever so subtly and then the fact of the Moon itself, right, on, on changing even things as much as uh, the tide and the sea level changes in high latitude region, for example, what Jan Mosten Hansen and, and Niklas Mona has found in all the study around Scandinavia. The short answer is no, obviously. <coughs> so now let me introduce to you this subject about defining season. I wanted to tell you a story of the big difference between some of these different definitions of season. Computer model is rather stupid in some sense because it's built by human. Human tries to say that you're going around a circle, you're 360 degrees, okay, we're going to define it by fixed day or we, we can't, but just fixed angle, so, you no, know, 360 degrees, so, you know, uh, uh, you just define like that, but then watch out, it depends on what you're doing you really can have a very, very different definition. Here, summer, if you do it a fixed angular way, you can see that even by using the length itself, you have nine days short, shorter compared to the other calendar. So which one are you gonna use? So you really have to stress those kinds of importance if you want to talk about physical system. One of the easiest way to see is basically to see how the, this is basically showing you the relative orbits of, of our, our Earth compared to all the different time period, let's say 6,000 years ago in the present time, they define it in 1950 or, or during the Emian 126,000 years ago. That all this stuff are really, really having very enormous effect. This is the stuff that explains 
essentially will explain all the ice ages obviously but if you look in terms of the actual definition of incoming sunlight January to December the top panel is simply showing you 90 south to 90 north showing you the distribution of sunlight classical it looked that way angular it doesn't look that much of a different but look at the numbers quantity right. quantitative number is everything <coughs> just by that kind of definition differences you can see already for the month of let's say uh, summer to fall huge differences okay uh, 50 watts per milliquart and these people are fighting about stuff that is talking about doubling of CO2 for 3 to 4 watts per meter square. And then in terms of actual output, you see if you use a different definition, so the top panel is showing you the temperature differences. If you use a classical minus the angular definition, we're talking about changes of temperature plus or minus 5 degrees Celsius. Depends on what definition you're using for the, for the angular. And then for rainfall, it's really, really a very important quantity for agricultural, for all these other purposes. And for me, the passion of studying the monsoon, obviously. So these are very, very important stuff that you should do. And remember, I tell you that we haven't got this definition correctly defined. And none of the climate model in GCM. Tell that to IPCC, of course, please. Let's announce it to them. I start with this picture just trying to motivate you because this is actually a real picture. You all know it's taken by the Deep Space uh, Climate Observatory, right? It's actually thanks to Al Gore for pushing this uh, satellite, but he failed, but then ultimately we committed the money. So this is sitting as a Lagrangian point, so about 1.6 million kilometers away. One can see this dynamic Earth in some sense, right? With the moon passing in front of it too. So now comes uh, the superstar of my, my work. I was very lucky to sort of uh, meet this guy on the internet. His name is Sion, so he's from Argentina. And for already almost uh, three to four years, we've been working very closely together. I think by now we have about three or four papers. One of the papers that I felt remarkably happy to be able to produce is that a lot of this time you, you kind of have the idea that you have to do this. You have to revisit this. The main primary problem is that if you don't realize anything about it is that if you ask yourself this question, if you want to study the orbital forcing for the last 10,000 years, the last previous actual result has been published by Professor Andre Berger in 1978, General Atmospheric Sciences. And even that solution, no one seems to realize that this is actually a very long-term perturbation problem. They treat it, you see, people forget about what the assumption went into this. So with this new work, we actually include a lot more factors. We have moon, we have rotation of the Earth, the whole business. This is why we can only solve the problem for Holocene boundary, basically. I have no confidence to deal with the ice ages because of distribution of mass are relatively unknown. So at least allow me to have this start, and then I will show you why with this understanding, we have far more enough of understanding to actually try to prescribe or define how the climate happens in the last 10,000 years, including present time, and even a bit to the, towards the future, as you know, because it's Newton law after all. Is this, the concept is to try to think about climate or insulation is indeed the basic idea of Milutin Milankovic, right? I hope most of you know who he is. Yeah? He's a servant engineer who's really this clever guy during the wartime, no computer, but do all this orbital solution calculation, try to find out how does the ice age come and go. He essentially come up with the idea that it is the high latitude, mainly he picked around 65 north, I can see 65 north is this circle here, essentially mainly covered by land, and he defined that it is the summer season is more important, because every time you come summer, you're bound to build some snow and ice, it's actually, if you want to accumulate the snow and to make it into ice sheets and something last like ice masses, it depends on how the summer insulation goes, so you'll melt how much of it during the summer. So if you persist that, the insulation, if the summer insulation is actually very low for a thousand or ten thousand, you're bound to build a very large ice age. Likewise, right, so you melted it away. So that's actually not a bad concept. It, it certainly needs some modification, obviously. You will see, because there are many, many theories are going about this. One of the first things that we can produce is basically this result, which is to combine what the intrinsic sun is doing plus the boundary condition, the, the orbital boundary condition. I show you winter, you know, spring, summer, and, and fall. I, only, 
I only wanted to focus a little bit, jump into this topic, to try to show you that this is actually the first ever results that show you that consistently including the best estimate of how the irradiance is changing intrinsically, plus the orbital effects. And then, lo and behold, this result came out by itself that you have indeed the Mondo minimum period is indeed one of the lowest uh, uh, summer insulation forcing at this high latitude region ever. Mm. So this reminds us of, of course, the Sun King himself, mm. which really a young guy who, who actually was somehow make the sun afraid and all the sunspot goes away. <laughs> but I want to tell you what good is this result that we're talking about here. I wanted to talk about the next stuff is essentially this idea that the changing insulation has a very, very powerful way to explain many phenomena. One of the phenomena that is very, I, I'm sure most of you know about it is indeed that the Arctic appears to be warming, so sea ice has, seems to be going away in the Arctic, whereas in the Antarctic, while the CO2 business is still predicting that uh, the model keep producing that uh, Antarctic will be warming up, there's just no doubt the observation is cooling. This is why you get more sea ice in the in the Antarctic. This is the way to look at it. Sea ice, Antarctic will be in the red curve. This is of course chart produced by early home look here. And then northern hemisphere, the ice is melting away. But you know that you can actually naturally explain this because of just the orbits. It's mainly because of the effects of, this is not my hypothesis by the way, it's a hypothesis by this, this guy who introduced a uh, sex pistol to the world, which means Duncan Steele. He's a very wild man, uh, but then he's also a very good scientist. He realized that over this last uh, few hundred years ago or so, that actually the Antarctic sea ice seems to be uh, increasing. But you know, that appears to be related to decreasing the spring insulation over in Antarctic. Whereas the Arctic one is because of increased spring insulation in the Arctic region. This is the way he showed this, which is mainly around here, you will see the, the spring insulation for Northern Hemisphere, and then around curve like this, around here, this is where the decrease, where you can actually produce this thing very naturally, without invoking any other nonsense that people are talking about in some sense. So for science, I also like something that can explain it simply, because this is the sort of, the, it doesn't mean it's completely correct. All I'm trying to tell you that you are actually have something that you can explain, you don't need to invoke another third hand or fourth hand or whatever it is you, that you want to do. Now, I also want to move further to try to explain to you uh, stuff that I've been doing over this past uh, so many years. One of the aspects that, that allows me to, to go further than anybody was actually to look at every data available. One of the most exciting things that I want to report to you is that everybody keeps saying that the sun could not do this, could not do that, but the evidence are everywhere. Even something as simple as stro uh, lower stratosphere. You can see already lower stratosphere temperature, and then the blue curve is this solar irradiance estimate. Do they, can they argue that there is no signal of the sun over there? And one of the hardest and confusing things all the time is that you all know that the sunspot come like roughly 11 years. And then sometimes when you don't see the 11 years imprint on any of the physical measurements on the system, you will just say, oh, the sun has no effect. But who says that you always have to see the 11 year cycle? You, maybe that the sun is somewhat of an effective low pass filter, so you tend to see in multi decadal time scale, for example. But then, even in terms of 11 year cycles, you really, if you look carefully and filter the data very carefully from surface to the stratosphere, you could easily pick up that signal. It's there. It's there all the time. And then it all depends on the amplitude, of course. What I really are always interested in is actually the large amplitude event which means the climate system operate and oscillate naturally, but all the large amplitude stuff is mostly in the long time scale. So one of the best one is roughly this stuff, what I call multi-decadal, roughly on the order of 50 to 100 years. I don't want to argue all this precision until I tell you how to explain the 50 to 100 year time scale variation. This is actually a result. The black curve is the Chinese temperature record, and then the gray line here is actually the estimate of the solar irradiance, okay? And doing this work, I was not very happy because, hey, man, correlation, you know, dude, you gotta have some, you know, decency, not to just be very happy. Hey, I found a correlation, I'm so smart. But the most exciting aspect of why I write a paper, by the way, I'm very conservative in writing paper. I don't want to write too many papers, by the way. 
it's because of this next result. Because as we all know, one of the hardest problems in climatology is what? It's not the sun and not all, it's really clouds, cloud field. Every time that you see some changes in the sun, let's say, most of the thing that you know, like this estimate for the solar irradiance, is always happening at the top of the atmosphere. The question has always been that can you really have this effect propagating down near surface? Then you are in business because once the radiation reach near surface, you can do all this sort of stuff. Dry the thermodynamics there, dry the hydrology, dry everything else, you know what I mean? Including even plants, for example. But one of the proud results that I was able to find is indeed same temperature, but uh, the dash curve here is actually the, the estimate of the sun sign duration. This is because my reading was going everywhere. This is actually a result from people in agriculture. Japanese Meteorological Agency tends to keep this record. So the, for the first time, we are actually showing that there is convincing evidence, at least somewhere on the planet, that there is this, you know, basically like a hole for the sunlight to come in. And therefore, I'm very convinced that most of this is physical rather than just statistical. And then it got even more exciting as I start doing more and more work. One of the joy of not having funding for research, by the way, is not very fun, but uh, the joy of doing science is that you always meet good people. These two are my most excellent colleagues. Their name is Roland and Michael Connolly. They are actually PhD scientists. It's just very, very smart people doing other things. And we work together. In this paper, we are very, very proud because we started to realize that there's a lot of problem in the thermometer temperature record. So we started to ask a very simple question. All this problematic sort of a thermometer record, let's ignore all of them. But can we come up with a better answer? Because science complaining all day long is also no good. You have to provide the solution, how you how you be able to see it. So we have a very, you know, every, every little school kid can think about this. We say, why don't we just look at the most rural station, find places where we know the temperature history, so you have a better handle of what is actually changing. This change has to be real rather than contaminated by what we call non-climatic effects, right? You, want, you don't want anything man-made. For example, this guy decided to go out, measure today at 12 o'clock, tomorrow he drink too much beer, so he, he go out at 3 o'clock. So that's a big problem. We don't want big things like that, right? So we just go around these four places where we have high confidence, look at the temperature record and see what we got. Here's the four, rural China, rural USA, rural Ireland, and Arctic Circle. And then we take just a composite average. So we call it Northern Hemisphere, uh, Northern Hemisphere uh, temperature record. You immediately realize that in Northern Hemisphere, by the way, it feed the sea surface temperature over Northern Hemisphere. Nobody realized that. Because the rest of those are the bogus results from uh, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Study. They always have this part way up high there, right? Mm. This actually, this kind of result immediately dispelled that most of what they saw is mainly non-climatic measurement. The true non-contaminated data actually look like this. <coughs> and obviously, you are very interested to ask this question. Okay, it changed. All right, how do you explain this? It turns out that actually you do have an explanation. Mm. And the explanation is indeed just simply an estimate of the solar irradiance changes. There is a very long story about explaining how you get the solar irradiance. Please, 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 anybody want to read, read. I have written, I don't know how many thousands of words of, to explain everything in detail, so please read them. Because that's, uh, that's more satisfactory. But then given the constraint of the time, I want to tell you that, you know, this is a reasonably interesting result. And first of all, we also publish it completely in Earth Science Review. And, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, every time they claim that we haven't published anything, I mean, too bad, you know, we did. But, but really, what is the real reason? Is it really just the direct sunlight doing it? I believe that it's more complex than that. Because especially you want to affect winter temperature in the Arctic where the sun is not doing anything. So immediately you realize that you need something pushing from the equator. So something about heat flux transfer from equator to pole. So one of the best measurements to, to check that is actually what we call equator to pole temperature gradient, EPTG. So here the curve is inverse. It's plotted as the blue curve here, where high is actually mean decreasing the gradient because you warm the Arctic relative to the equator, so you actually reduce the gradient. And then the opposite goes that way, so increase gradient is that way down. There is a very interesting effect here, and then I actually published this paper in 2013, a bit earlier than the other paper. And then 
while I was trying to think about a contribution to honor my friend, Professor late Professor Bob Carter from Australia, in a book chapter, I actually stumbled upon this result that I felt is respectable enough to honor him by showing this original result. It turns out that if you look around, this thing is closely related to how much the water vapor uh, anomalies is uh, in, in the atmosphere, in northern hemisphere. So there is some relationship there. Other than that, I just can tell you that this is actually a result that is fairly robust and we have published it. If it's wrong, just tell us why and how. So that's about all I can do about science. Then I want to move on to a subject that I believe most of us is of interest. <laughs> okay, what about next? Right? What about the future? So we all know that stuff like asteroid, we can track their orbits, so we can pretty much also, if you know all these different uh, stuff, you can actually try to track in the, the algorithm in terms of orbital dynamics to see how you can calculate this thing. This guy is actually coming in November, so beware. <laughs> so, we, we, we are now facing this problem in terms of prediction of the future. One of my favorite quote is actually this, this quote, actually a little known tiny book published by MIT Press, Weather and Forecasting as a Problem in Physics, 1972. It's by, of course, a good mathematician, uh, Andrea Sergovich Monin. He actually says something very clear. He said that the greatest attention should be devoted to the question whether there is a connection between the Earth weather and the fluctuation in solar activity. The presence of such a connection would be almost a tragedy for meteorology. <laughs> it would evidently mean that you would be first necessary to predict solar activity in order to predict the weather. <laughs> Quite true in some sense, but then, you know, this is why we work extra hard to find those predictions that is meaningful. What I'm trying to say is that the internet is full of all kinds of stuff, so you have physics to statistics to extrapolation to numerology. I do tend to find that most of them are noises, you cannot believe how many amount of email I get and questions that I get from just about anyone that don't even know me somehow. They just think that I'm God, I can answer everything. But then I just don't, I just do what I do. I'm going to pick two studies that I think is promising in terms of looking a little bit further into the future. One of them is by Scott McIntosh and Bob Lemon. Le Bob Lemon is at NASA. Scott McIntosh, McIntosh is actually the current director of uh, uh, high, high Altitude Observatory in Boulder, Colorado. Another one is by Victor Velasco, he's also my collaborator, but I was not involved in that paper. The first work is actually ideas of trying to study how the different magnetic region, the dynamo wave essentially, are propagating over time. This is just showing you an example of a regular sunspot period. In fact, the blue and the red thing are just simply telling you the belt of the magnetic zone propagating, depends on the time, from slightly higher latitude, mid-latitude down to the equator. And then the blue and the, the color is simply telling you the polarity of the magnetic field itself. But what McIntosh and uh, Lemon propose is that perhaps when you have system that slightly longer and thinner, so at the equal time, the bands, the belt are all slightly overlapped. So he tried to say that perhaps modern minima can be explained with something like a three to six kind of overlap band system versus the regular time that you have only two to four of them. At the, same, at the same time, which you will cancel the amplitude and then you lower the amplitude. This is not a bad idea at all, actually. It is somewhat not too bad. Except how they actually want to turn that into a realistic prediction, I'm not too sure. So which means the, the burden of proof fell upon them if they want to make a claim to be very famous. Science is like that, right? I mean, if you want to gamble, gamble big, show us how, right? Don't just chit-chat and talk nonsense. This is another of my good friend, uh, Victor Velasco. He's at University of Mexico. And uh, he has produced a very, very nice paper, in my opinion, because uh, I have to admit that I was the editor for this uh, paper, so you can see. <laughs> but I was being fair at all time. I don't give favor to anyone, so you, can, you don't have to corrupt me. I, I won't be corrupted. So anyway, he produces a very nice paper, essentially trying to tell you that from based on the past study of the Iranians last thousand years or so, well, what we wanted to focus on is basically this blue area, uh, this green area, roughly showing you that two different methods roughly showing you that maybe the irradiance will decrease, okay, around 20, well, starting, uh, it's already starting, but then it's going to be predicting about 2030, 20, 2050 sort of changes. I believe our friend Niklas Mono had done some prediction to himself. So, but to explain that, how the prediction works, I think it's very important. This is why I want to take another few minutes to explain to you, right? How does it work? 
<clears throat> if you look at a time like the modern minimum time from 1645 to 1720, the reason why it works is that because if you analyze in terms of the signal in, in, the, in the database, it's actually dominated by this 100 to 200 years time or time scale. And the reason why the minima is so deep for the modern minimum is that the facing, the negative face for most of this wave actually coincided very well, almost perfectly, the timing. Right? So that's why you got a very deep minima. For the 21st century minima, the facing is not as good, so it's not as deep in some sense. But predicting the timing is one thing that we can do if we know the theory of this origin of this period, which I'll explain we do. But then predicting the amplitude, I think, is a much, much harder business, which means we need more thinking. So here to summarize for you from his table is that he actually predicted that the 21st century minima is already started. Because if you want to talk about typical length of all this minimum, it's of the order of 50 to 70 years. And he predicted that this thing is actually going to go from, depends on the method and what type of data you, you put in, it's, it's basically going to last for the next uh, 50 years or so. Okay? So I'm going to summarize in terms of what we know about future prediction of the climate activity. By the way, that's not all the business, so that's why I want to give you more excitement about my own contribution. What I wanted you to focus on is mainly this red part, which is to say that that's the reason. The reason why you get all this thing is mainly because of the co-facing of the two important time scale. Now, of course, there are more time scale involved, but for the near term, I think these two are very dominant. This is part of the reason why this, I think, believe this prediction scheme would work and why many people appear to be making the same kind of prediction. Okay? Which means coincidence sometimes can be correct because it depends. Because these two skills are very dominating. Then I want to say that uh, my good friend Sion So and I, as you know, we have already the solution. Sure. So what's, what's to stop us for going forward, right? <laughs> no problem. We, we integrate that forward. So we did that. And here's a paper that we produced. That just came out, I think, a month ago, or even actually not yet even actually in print, but it's, it's out there, 2018. And we actually was trying to think about how does the future look in some sense. But then we mainly wanted to produce a more physical intuition about climate. We don't want to talk about only in situ uh, insulation, like what uh, Milankovitch idea, right? We also want to emphasize an important thing called a latitudinal insulation gradient because that will be very helpful. This is the hint of the title for my talk that was selected by Jan Eric Soheim on uh, hurricanes. It does can tell you some information about the hurricanes. And to, to start the, the hint is basically another Ole Holmlum uh, great, great plot. By the way, if none of you know about this particular uh, database and this particular service, Everybody should talk to this guy. He made the most beautiful plot <laughs> and most updated plot for all the time series, ocean, what have you, everything. This is really a very great service to the community. And this is the kind of stuff you can easily show. And he's a very fair person. I mean, if the data are going the other way, he won't change it, of course. He will just show you everything. This is the kind of stuff that is real true service for science. So now, first thing we look at is 65 North, insulation. December, obviously not so interesting, right? But December, we don't see no sun in high latitude. Okay, that's fine. But it's really true that in summer insulation, it's been decreasing. Remember, it's not too, it's not too small. This is over three to, two to three watts, okay? And then the, the equinox, September month and March, you can see also going down. So you can see over this fall season, you roughly have everything going in the same direction. By the way, that, that, that's forward forecast, you have to include the irradiance estimate plus the, the orbital, of course. But I tell you, the orbital is dominant in the sense that the season ain't going away. So you've got to have that ever-evolving small changes around to be careful about this. This is why I try to say that, you know, this IPCC is going to be an absolute filler in terms of this sand. That we gain more, the more we learn about it, put it this way the more we are very confident that this IPCC should just go away in that sense. Such a troublemaker in that sense. They keep talking about that little thing, but then they forgot about this guy. In fact, I want to propose with Jan Eric that some of us should actually work together to try to make this international conference on uh, what about the future cooling, right? We should really have a major conference, uh, having everybody contributing their ideas. To In that sense, you can take the, the, the what you call CO2 eyeballs away from the IPCC, put it that way. 
But it turns out that this future prediction stuff is much more useful for even study of extreme event. Here is one example to tell you about hurricane activity in the 70s. One of this particular date here, this map showing you all the, the low pressure region, where you can see that in September 11 and 12 of 1971, you get five simultaneous uh, hurricanes occurring in the Atlantic Basin. You got the Irene, Edith, Ginger, Heidi, and uh, Fern, right? At the same time, this is actually indeed during the cold period. And I want to show you how the next 100 years, this is what future look like. Some, with December, it depends on what December is doing. Maybe we run out of battery. <coughs> Hello? Yeah. We're out of battery, so I'll keep going. Uh, you have the increasing gradient. But for the summer latitude, we actually have a decreasing gradient, which means probability of a more hurricane activity seems to be will be reduced in that sense. So I I almost done. Is this on? <coughs> Hello. It works. Okay. Hello? Okay. Fine. Then I want to show you this. Yeah. Okay. It's back. Uh, maybe this guy is afraid of me. Huh? We're going to show you this, this actually very exciting uh, geological evidence actually. It's talking about increasing hurricane frequency in Florida during cold, younger, drier. You all know about the younger, dry period, right? But especially from Greenland's eye core, you can see this very, very dramatic sharp drop of the temperature uh, around about 12 to 13,000 years ago. But this evidence is actually from this group of uh, uh, people from the U.S. Geological Survey in, in uh, Reston, Virginia where they found a lot of this uh, sediment there where they study some of these pebbles, this big size kind of stuff, where they actually was able to show you that around younger dryers time, you can see here now the younger dryers is from your right to your left. You can see the, the grain size appears to be fluctuating much larger, so which means much more stormy, so much more hurricane activity during those younger dryers time compared to the, actually the when you reach the Holocene. <laughs> and that is also explained by essentially the, the temperature gradient uh, uh, that is actually controlling this, this thing. So that I'm trying to tell you that the insulation, insulation gradient can give you information on the temperature gradient and therefore you have some control on, on how to estimate the hurricane activity, for example. And I, I show you how rich the, in terms, if you analyze these data sets in terms of wavelet power, you can see there's all this multi-decadal and multi-centennial power in it. And I think since we're almost run out of time, let me conclude. I would only have this to say about future because it's really still difficult. As I say, you, we may know the phase of the cooling reasonably well. We still don't know how deep it's going to be. It requires a lot more understanding than that. Hopefully, we'll learn very quickly enough that we can say a lot more. But I'm quite sure that the proposition of Rising carbon dioxide is going to cause global warming. In fact, it's going the opposite direction from what we say, right? So let's, let's put a good pet and a good smile on, on, on those guys and see what will happen. And I'm quite sure also that what they have done so far is clearly not scientific. It's not only not scientific, it's anti-scientific because they actually have no evidence and they make all this sort of false statement and that kind of stuff. So I want to say that it is the business of the future to be dangerous, indeed. So one don't be, should not be always be controlled by fear. It is among the merit of science that equip the future for its duty. So let's stick to science and and, and I, I'm very, very grateful to be here. And later, if you want to hear about how bad science has been, that will be my next talk about censorship and all that. So it's more about politics than, than science. This talk is already a little bit more too extra, but uh, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Mm -hmm.